Awesome. <laughs> well, welcome to the National Book Festival and to AI, they just want to be our friends. Kind of. <laughs> totally. <laughs> My name's Colleen Chogan. I'm the 11th Archivist of the United States. <laughs> I'm also a writer and an author, and I love the National Book Festival. I'm honored to welcome T.J. Klune to this year's book festival. T.J. is a New York Times bestselling author of fantasy and romance. His book, Into This River I Drown, won the Lambda Literary Award for Best Gay Romance. The House in the Cerulean Sea received the Alex Award. which is an American Library Association designation for one of the best YA books written that year. TJ is an advocate for better LBGTQ plus representation in books. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about that today when we talk about his latest novel, In the Lives of Puppets. <laughs> So we'll have plenty of time for conversation at the end. So if you have questions for TJ, please line up at one of our two microphones the last 10 or 15 minutes. And then after this presentation at 1.30, TJ will be signing books uh, down on the second level, uh, level two north. We'd also like to thank Mr. David Rubenstein for his sponsorship of this stage. Okay, TJ, so I, I told you backstage, but I really thoroughly enjoyed this book. I was- Thank you. I zoomed right through it uh, because once I started it, I really couldn't put it down. For everyone, I, I suspect a lot of people might have, have read it, but for those that have not, can you tell us a little bit about what the book's about and what your inspiration was for the book? Yes, uh, absolutely. And I know that there's probably a lot of people here who think, oh, authors probably have these big, huge, wonderful, grand stories about how their novels came to be. Hi, I'm not that author. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm here to tell you that this book exists because of capitalism. <laughs> Why does this book exist because of capitalism? because one day I decided to buy a Roomba vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Here's what happens with our funny, weird little brains. Humans, we have this tendency to anthropomorphize or give human qualities to inhuman things. Mm -hmm. I am one of those people, so therefore I had to put googly eyes on my little Roomba vacuum cleaner. I had to give him a name, which is Hank, and then as you do when you first get one of these machines, you turn it on so it can go around and map out its ho your house and see where it's supposed to go. This little machine immediately got itself stuck in a corner and made the saddest beeping sound I have ever heard anything made. I'm not even kidding you. It went over there and it was like, oh, beep. <laughs> and I was like, I did not know you could make such noise as funny little machine. And for some reason, I don't know how, I don't know why, it's never happened to me before or since, but I had this full story in my head. I knew that there was gonna be a character that was gonna be a vacuum cleaner named Rambo because nobody else had ever had that name before in the entire world. <laughs> I knew that there was gonna be a human and the human was gonna be the main character, but I also knew that if there was gonna be a human raised by machines, there would need to be some kind of health monitoring, mm -hmm. nurse kind of machine, but oh my God, what if she was a sociopath? <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of built up from there. And I, I, I've, for a long time, I'd been wanting to do something with, with Carlo Collodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio. Because as most, uh, as most of you probably are aware, we are used to the Disney sheen or the Disneyfication of fairy tales and fables. So when we get to see the old stories, Collodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio is extraordinarily dark. Mm -hmm. In the first draft, when he was originally writing Pinocchio, it was meant to be a serial. It was gonna be published either weekly or monthly in the newspapers or in a magazine. In the original version of this children's story, Pinocchio is murdered mm -hmm. and he gets hung by a tree for his hubris to becoming mm -hmm. human. And his editor came back after reading and said, you know, you really can't mess with kids like that. Mm -hmm. So you need to rewrite it. So he did, he rewrote it to the story that we know today. And while the Disney version from 1940 does have some 
scary moments. If you remember it, there's the scene where the children turn into donkeys. The story itself is so much more, it's dark. It has this undercurrent of darkness through it. And I think that we lose a lot of that darkness when we look at these old fairy tales and fables because most of us only know them from Disney mm -hmm. at this point in time. So I wanted to explore the darkness of Collodi's work, but I also wanted to explore the biggest question that I think I've asked of any book that I've ever written is what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned Pinocchio. I also, when I was reading the book, I wanted to ask you, I thought of two other stories that might have influenced you, but mm -hmm. I don't know. The Wizard of Oz. Absolutely. And, and Frankenstein. Absolutely. Okay. So The Wizard of Oz, if you have not seen The Wizard of Oz in a theater on a big screen, man, it is going to change your life. It'll change the way you look at color from the way that sepia tone Kansas mm -hmm. flips to the color of Oz. There is nothing like it, especially on a big screen. Mm -hmm. Mary Shelley, she is the queer goth girl who invented the science fiction and fantasy genre. Mm -hmm. She invented this genre with Frankenstein. And guess what? Most people don't know this. Her second novel, she essentially invented the post-apocalyptic genre because she wrote for her second novel a post-apocalyptic book. Mm -hmm. So you have this queer goth teenager because she wrote Frankenstein at the age of 19. And for a long time, for whatever reason, science fiction and fantasy became this straight white male game with a few notable exceptions. So you have the mother of science fiction and fantasy being this queer woman. And I wanted to pull from that because I wanted to pull from, from what basically started this genre as a whole. And Frankenstein obviously is just a, a masterful story to begin with. But there's also a couple of other inspirations that some people might not know. If you are of a certain age, you were probably traumatized by an animated movie called The Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> In The Brave Little Toaster, which is about a bunch of uh, appliances that are sent to you, think of Toy Story except with toasters, um, there's, a, there's a character called Lampy, who's a lamp. And Lampy dies horribly. His light bulb gets broken, and you think he's dead. And that is the most traumatizing thing that I have ever seen. So, of course, I wanted to bring that right. to this book. Yes. <laughs> but also, if you have not seen The Brave Little Toaster, do so. And just know that right when you finish with that, you can watch the sequel, The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> as one does. Now, this is a, a dystopian story because it's a post-apocalyptic right. world, at least for humans. But I found it to be a really hopeful book. It's not a hopeless book. It's a hopeful book. Why was that important to you? Because, in essence, Victor, as the novel opens, is the only human. Mm -hmm. What would it feel like to be in that position? What would it feel like to know that the world is gone and you, you are the, one of the only or maybe the only left one of your kind or the last one left of your kind? To me, you can either go two directions with that. You can either sink into despair and despondence or you could have hope for a better future that, that maybe things won't always work out like they're supposed to, but as long as you don't stop trying to make your world, not the world, but your world, a better place, mm -hmm. then hope is always going to be there. You know, I, I, I think a lot about where we've, what we've been through the past few years. And I'm just going to speak on the pandemic. I don't need to go further back than that. But, you know, a lot of us had our whole worlds change and we didn't know what to do. And it's still scary right now, even. And I don't know that we've allowed ourselves to properly grieve over the time lost, over the people lost, over the way that everybody's life has changed. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, I'm filled with hope because I know that what's going on in the world right now, what we see in the news and every single day, everything, all the, all the evil and the pain, is not representative of who we are as a people. We are, yes, do some of us hurt and harm and break and destroy? Yes, but so many more of us help. So many of us have hope and want to make the world a better place. So that's why I write what I do, because even if I'm writing about the fantastical, I want there to be a, a pervasive sense of hope, of momentum, of mm -hmm. things don't have to stay the way they are just because that's the way it is. We can make changes together mm -hmm. if we just try. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
so you mentioned this earlier. Uh, the, there's only one human character in the book. Uh, as far as we know, he's the last human on the planet. The rest of the characters are robots. Was there, is there any distinction in your book between robots and humans? Were there any differences? Not necessarily. I, th I think it's important that in, in this book that we, we look at it for, for what these characters are. If, if you know anything about me as a writer, you know I'm very big on found family. It's kind of the, the trope of all tropes. But here's the thing that I need people to understand about the trope of found family, especially since it's being used in marketing a lot by publishers now. Found family comes from a very real place. That comes from queer people who did not get the love and the support and the hope that they should have from their parents or their guardians or their family. I am one of those people. I got made fun of for my love of reading. I got made fun of for my love of writing. Anything that brought me joy was something that could be taken away from me. So I learned to hide the things that made me happy. My family is consistent of my brother, my sister, and everybody else in our family is not related by blood. So many queer people, that is our reality. We were not accepted by people who should have known better. Mm -hmm. So we had to go out and make our own homes. Mm -hmm. That's what I see when I yeah. see these characters in this book. These are characters who all are misfits in their own way. You know, you have in Kalodi's story, you have the Land of Toys, which was about a bunch of misfits. Mm -hmm. You have this group of people, all of whom, all except for one, are not actually people and you have them becoming a family, not because they're forced to or because it's in their programming, mm. it's because they're choosing to. They have autonomy to make this decision that they want to stay with these others because that is who they love. And I wanted to explore what that looks like from a human perspective. I could have easily made this book about one of the machines, mm -hmm. but I think having it be a human surrounded by machines makes it that much more interesting. Okay. So Vic is your protagonist. He's the, the one human. He is surrounded by um, a father who loves him, although he's a robot, and friends that are also robots. But he does seem a little lonely. Uh, and then he meets Hap, who is also a robot. Mm -hmm. Now, they both identify as male, I think, mm -hmm. in, in the book, as far as we can tell. But is it because there's humans, there's a human and a robot and, and involved in a relationship, it seemed to me like it's a post-gender world. You know, the, is, is gender part of this or not? Uh, not necessarily, because if you look, if you go into later on, if you, mm -hmm. when you're introduced, I won't spoil it too much here, but when you're introduced to the Blue Fairy, who the yes. Blue Fairy of this world is, they are non-binary. They use they, them pronouns. Mm -hmm. And the, point, the thing to me I thought about, especially when I was writing about what, what would matter mm -hmm. in this world, mm -hmm what would not matter. Gender would not matter. And I, the fact that it matters in this world at this point in time right now is absolutely ridiculous. But, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a post-apocalyptic world like that, I thought about what things are so absolutely trivial right. that it would not, it would, sexuality, mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, Victor is out and on page as an asexual person and that's discussed and that's respected and that is, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's not just you know, lumping it all into one box. Mm -hmm. You have the, the whole idea with gender. Yes, in, in a post-apocalyptic world, who gives a crap about gender? Who gives a, it, it, no, it, that stuff should not matter now and it should not matter in this story. It's, it's why I don't include things like homophobia in, the, right. in my books that I write because you know, homophobia is boring. I know what homophobia is. I don't need to put that in my books because everybody else in the world knows what homophobia is. Mm -hmm. It's time to, you know, people who are homophobic are boring. Let's just plain and simple. They are boring, <laughs> boring people. <laughs> so the book does deal with, with these themes. So in many ways, it's a very serious book, but it's also a really funny book. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I mean, so funny that it was laugh out loud funny yeah. on some of the lines. A lot of them, n not all of them, but a lot of them come from Nurse Ratchet, who is a very funny character. Yeah, sociopaths often are. <laughs> right. I found it myself, why do I find her so funny? Why do I self-identify with her? And you saying that she's a sociopath makes me worried a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? At the end of the day, I think we're all a little crazy, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, but tell me a little bit, why is humor so important for you as a writer? How do you use it effectively in your books? 
humor can be, um, I think with like with everything that I write, it, I, you know, I was talking with a friend of mine a, a short time ago, and I basically said, my job is to lie to all of you. My job is to manipulate you. My job is to make you feel a certain way that I want to make you feel in a book. And I thought about that. I was like, that sounds a little, eh, you know, I don't want to think I'm manipulating all of you, but hell yes, I'm lying to you when I'm writing these stories. Mm -hmm. um, but levity is so important. Humor is so important because if we're just mired in darkness all the time, that's all we'll know. Mm. That's all we'll absolutely know. And I, I've been there. I know what that feels like. I, back in 2013, I lost uh, someone I loved very, very much. Um, and it led me to a place of deep cynicism, of deep darkness, of deep toxicity. And I was not a good person because of that. And grief, grief is such a weird animal that it strikes you in in insurmountable ways, and it doesn't affect anybody here the same way. That's what's so fascinating about human beings is that we all experience something called grief, but no two people experience it the same way. I went the dark route. I, I felt myself collapsing in on myself. I hated everyone and everything because everybody else was going on with their life where mine was completely raised to the ground. And th thanks to large amounts of therapy, I was able to pull myself out of that. But at the same time, I remember what joy a smile could bring or something funny could bring. So just little bits of laughter. It doesn't make everything else go away, but it makes you stop just for a second. And so writing through that grief is how I know mm -hmm. myself. It's how I learned a lot about myself. Humor as a kid for me was a defense mechanism because if I had bullies or if my parents or whatever, I could be funny and that might be my saving grace at least for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And humor now to me is not a weapon. Humor to me is a blanket. It makes me feel good because I like it when people can read something, laugh in one paragraph and then maybe start crying in the very next paragraph. I love that idea of helping the reader explore their own feelings through the characters that I've created. Now, when I wrote my novels, I loved writing dialogue. I'm a dialogue Oh, writer. yeah. I oh, love yeah. it. Do you like writing dialogue? I love writing dialogue to the point where I do this thing after I finish each and every book that I write, I actually go through and I read all my dialogue out loud to make sure it sounds like a person actually talking. Because, right. you, you know, you've read books where... Right you know, maybe whatever situation is happening in the book, but you think no human being actually talks like this. Right, and right. I, I, don't, I don't want that. Even if I'm writing about the fantastical, I want these to feel like real people. I know Chauncey's not real from the house in the Cerulean Sea, but you know what? He's real to me and I love him. Mm -hmm. So uh, this book, I mean, the, the title of this discussion actually has uh, AI in it, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the world that you've created and in the lives of puppets, all the humans are dead except for one. Um, so what, were you motivated by artificial intelligence, ongoing debate, obviously, in the United States and the world today? Were you motivated by that? Do you have any thoughts on it? I wrote this book back in 2018. Okay. So it was written before all before. the chat GPT and all of that stuff. Although, how many of you remember Smarter Child on AOL Instant Messenger? Do you remember that? Yeah. So we had our own little weird AI thing. But um, I wrote this back in 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it at the time because I was like, oh, wow, nobody ever does Pinocchio adaptations mm -hmm. anymore, so I might as well <laughs> do my own. And then, of course, we get towards the release date. I'm like, oh, so everybody does Pinocchio adaptations mm -hmm. now. That's super cool. <laughs> um, but it, it's, I, I the story is, 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 is not necessarily me commenting on artificial intelligence, but I don't think that I could have planned a release for this book better than I could right. have now with the way that the world is now. So I'm probably gonna say a couple of things that might offend a couple of people in this room. Mm -hmm. And for that, I do not apologize, <laughs> all right? So as of late, you all might have seen people posting AI art and calling themselves artists. You might see authors, quote unquote, using artificial intelligence to write books and posting those books on Amazon and selling those books and calling themselves an author. They are not an author. Okay, here's my thing. And 
I talk about it in this book. I talk about it in, in, in The Lives of Puppets. No matter how advanced technology becomes, no matter how lifelike machines become, they will never have a human soul. And I'm not speaking of that in any religious sense. I'm talking about they will never have our drive. They will never have our passion. Creativity, art, comes from anger. It comes from rage. It comes from joy. It comes from a myriad of different emotions that we all feel that something a machine can never, ever feel. So when I see people saying, yeah, I wrote this book, and by wrote, they mean they put prompts into chat GPT and it published a book. There was an article recently about an author who has written 70 variations on Pride and Prejudice using chat GPT right. and has published those books on Amazon and people oh. buy the books. And it's essentially the same version of a story over and over and over again, just with different prompts in that. Mm -hmm. And that is being allowed to be published and that is to some people considered a book. Mm -hmm. It will never, no matter what, how, again, how advanced machines become, they will never ever be able to replace humanity because it is our souls that make us who we are. It is our brains, it is our laughter, it is our joy, it is our pain, it is our suffering that makes the art come from us. And a machine can never do that no matter how much they learn, ever. Um, I read in the acknowledgments of your book, it's always important, I feel like, to read the acknowledgments, but in, uh, in The Lives of Puppets, you had an interesting comment, which I wanted to ask you about. You oh. said that you had edited this book more than, I believe you said, any other book, the editing yes. process. And this yeah. is painful for writers it often. It is. See, I, I normally, editing is wonderful. I love editing. Mm -hmm. Editing is one of my favorite parts. This book sucked <laughs> to edit. Right. Let me tell you why. My publisher knows I talk about this, so there's, nobody's getting in trouble for any of this. In the first draft, Victor was a person with autism. I wanted to, there's a trope or stereotype that goes around that say people with autism act like machines. And I wanted to subvert that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show that even a person with autism raised by machines mm -hmm. would be so human that their, their humanity would be undeniable. I, all, I am neurodiverse in that I have ADHD. People with autism are also neurodiverse, but that does not equate my experience to a person with autism. So what do I do? I research. Mm -hmm. I talk to people with autism, talk to parents of children with autism, talk to medical professionals in the autistic mm -hmm. community. I read books and blogs and listen to podcasts by, for, and about people with autism before I ever set putting a, book to, a word to page. When this sort of thing happens, I always request something known as a sensitivity reader, mm -hmm. which is essentially a person from a community I'm writing in to read what I've written to make sure I'm doing it correct. Right. We hired two sensitivity readers. They both came back and said it was obvious I had done my research, that it was some of the best representation they'd ever read, and that they could not wait to share that with their community as representation done right. Mm -hmm. Then there was a third sensitivity reader. <laughs> this third sensitivity reader said this book was the most problematic, offensive thing she had ever read, oh. and that it should never be published, that not even a person with autism should have attempted to write a book like that. And I was devastated. Mm -hmm. I was furious, but I was also devastated because I kept thinking, who is this person to come in and tell me what? But I hired them mm. to do that. Right. That's their job. So I can't be upset at a person for doing their job. Right. And so what do we look at? So what does the publisher do? The publisher then looked at the reports. They saw the two sensitivity read reports that were good. They saw the one that wanted that was not good. Mm -hmm. They decided to go with the one that was one. Okay. And I, I initially thought to myself, I have never had my work interfered with on this level before. And then I stopped and said, I've published over 30 books, and this is the first time mm -hmm. something like that has happened. I'm doing pretty good. Right. I'm doing okay. I think I'm doing pretty good. And so it was one of those things that, yes, I can be upset about it. Yes, I can have... I could be angry about it. Yes, I can think that my story was mm -hmm. good as it was, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm not a person with autism. Right. So I cannot ever speak for the autistic community. Mm -hmm. And so maybe she was right. Maybe there would have been a, a people that would have found offense to it. People with autism aren't a monolith, like any other marginalized group. You're not a monolith. What works for one right. might not work for another. And 
though I sometimes go back and forth on, on what I think should be allowed in creativity, at the same time, I want to continue to inspire hope. And you can't mm -hmm. inspire hope when you're hurting others. You're uh, a really a remarkable writer for a lot of reasons, but you, one of the reasons is that you don't just write in one genre. You write uh, across genres, and that's unusual. ADHD, <laughs> that's how it happens. <laughs> that's working for you. That's, yeah. that's kind of unusual in the publishing uh, industry. Tell us about writing across genres, why you like to do that, and also who are some of your influences? Who do you like to read? Uh, Terry Pratchett is obviously a big one. Diana Wynne Jones, Howl's Moving Castle is one of the best books ever written. Um, there's a couple of books as recently that I've read that I'm just A, seething with jealousy that I did not write, and B, am so grateful that these books exist. How many of you have heard of a book called uh, Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White? It's a young adult novel, but it is the one of the flat out best queer horror novels I have ever read in, in I, I don't know, and this is this dude's first book. I was like, oh, good for you, go to hell. <laughs> 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 but Andrew Joseph White, it's just remarkable. And then you have contemporary queer authors like Anna Marie McLemore, who, is, who wrote a book called Lake Lore that is one of the best re uh, representations of neurodiverse characters that I've ever read and trans. You have Rika Aoki who wrote Light from Uncommon Stars, mm -hmm. which is one of the best trans novels, one of the best pieces of LGBTQ fiction I have read in the last 10 years. I think it's remarkable. I, getting to see people like me or people like others like themselves in their community, whether it, be, whether it be trans people, whether it be queer people, whether it be other marginalized communities, getting to see them tell their stories, getting to have the option and the opportunity to tell their stories in ways that hasn't been done before is extraordinary. I grew up, I was born in the 80s, I came of age in the 90s. I remember distinctly how it felt never seeing myself in a book. Never. And I told myself that if I was ever going to write, if I was ever going to be an author, I would never want that to happen to people right. like me ever again. And so I think about all these amazing queer and authors of color who are coming to science fiction and fantasy and putting their mark on it and telling the stories where we have always belonged, mm -hmm. that it's just so great. And I love genres. As I said, ADHD makes me bounce around everywhere else, but science fiction and fantasy has always been my safe place. It has always okay. been my home, and I will continue to write in this genre until I can write no more. Okay, great. Our last question before we go to audience members. I know you have a lot of uh, fans out there who will want to ask you uh, a lot of questions. So tell us, uh, what are you working on now, if you're working on anything, or what do you plan to be working on? And how do you want to evolve or change as a writer as your career progresses? I, I, will, I will never be the world's best writer. I will never be the world's greatest writer. I don't need to be. I just need to be a little bit better than I was the day before. Mm -hmm. that, is what I'm, that is what I hope to do. Um, what I'm working on now, uh, I'm going to get in trouble if I say. So I'm going to say this. Next year, next, sometime next year, I have a new novel coming out that has not been announced yet that is going to break all of your brains. Whoa. You are, going, you are not going to believe what's coming your way. And trust me, wow. when that announcement comes and you are all freaking out, just know that I will be gleefully going, yes. <laughs> yes, this is all part of my plan, yes. So next year, um, it's going to be a very big book, and I'm very, very wow. excited about it. That's I'm exciting. actually in the middle of editing it right now, and I do have to say, it's really good. Oh. <laughs> it's a really good book. That's always great whenever you actually are in the editing phase and you're rereading it. And you're like, oh, this is, yeah, this is actually better than I thought. Well, then you get to so the next bad. page and you're like, oh, no, it's not. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so we do have two microphones if anybody uh, wants Don't to. Don't be nervous. Yeah. There's only hundreds of people in this room and you have to stand up in front of everyone and ask a question. You can do it. I believe in you. You can do it. Look at this microphone. It's so lonely right here. Oh, oh, there goodness. we go. There we go. All there right. Go. go ahead. Look I've at you. It. I like your hair. You're welcome. I like your shoes. Thank you. This is my capitalism. Oh. This, is, this is what I was like, OK, fine, I'll give you money. Give me gay things. Yeah. <laughs> Hate capitalism until it caters to me. Me, right. And they're like, oh, yes, gay people also have money. And it's not June? What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Um, so my question is, uh, I work in a public library in the teen section, and sometimes your books, like the Extraordinary mm -hmm. Series, mm -hmm. which is fantastic, um, are considered YA. The House in the Cerulean Sea is considered a YA book, but we have it cataloged as an adult novel. Uh -huh. and I wondered what your thoughts were mm. on how to... The House in the Cerulean Sea is the main character is a 40-year-old man. It yeah. should not be YA. Yeah, but it still won an award. It, yeah, it won the Alex Award for an adult novel that crosses over with young adult fiction. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Hell yeah! Um, but no, I, I get what you're saying with that. It, it has been a lot of people have that same question. To me, if a character is not a young adult, then it's not necessarily just for a young adult. In this book, in this case, The House in the Australian Sea, Linus Baker is 40 years old, so I consider it an adult novel that crosses over. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I still like your hair. It's over, wonderful. Over here on this over here. side. Hi. <laughs> Hello there. Uh, my name is Christian. Um, I'm just a member of the reading public. Um, I'm kind of curious. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Um, has have any of the stories about people um, ostensibly falling in love with chatbots influenced this book? And even if they haven't, um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on the phenomenon in general. Of people falling in love with chatbots? Correct. Yes. Oh my God. Does this have to make me tell you that I probably had a crush on Smarter Child when I was younger? <laughs> my, my, my 11 year old AOL screen name XX Lost Dreamer XX. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, man. I. What, what was that movie that, that came out with Joaquin Phoenix about him falling? Her, right, right, right. Yeah. Look, if you fall in love with something that is not human, that's your business. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. But at the same time, I do think that humans need human connection. I think that we need humanity. That Because if anything, artificial intelligence like Jet, chat GPT and stuff like that, it only tell you what you need to hear, and that's not that's not conducive of a good and healthy relationship. And also, you probably shouldn't bonk a machine. So, <laughs> next question. Here we go over here. Hi, as an aut eh. as an autistic individual, is there any world in which that first draft could be mm. viewed by the public? Uh, good question. Maybe, like a special edition somewhere down the road. I don't know. I have to tell you. That took a lot out of me to do that because in essence, and you know, I don't want anybody to think of it this way because it's definitely not what the uh, sensitivity reader had intended. But for me, it felt like I was being asked to cure Victor. And I hated that feeling because people like me, people like you, neurodiverse people, we're not broken. We don't need to be fixed. We are exactly as we're supposed to be. If anything needs to be fixed, it's the other people who think that, we need, that we're broken somehow. So maybe one day, we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. I like your shoes. <laughs> Over here, hi. Hi. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that The House in the Cerulean Sea is probably my favorite book, so mm -hmm. thank you. Oh, well, you advice. might be my favorite person. Thank you. <laughs> And um, I was just wondering, like, what was your process for coming up with the universe that they live in and, like, the characters? Absolutely. So it should be surprising to no one that I, I am a very character-driven author, meaning that characters, it's going to sound like, I could have either grown up to be a psychopath or a writer, is how it works. <laughs> characters speak to me. I hear their voices in my head. Lucy was the very first character I heard from the house in the Sterling Sea. I knew he was not going to be the main character but I knew he was going to be a big character. And so when it came to filling out the kids and how I wanted this to work, I knew that magic was always gonna be something that I wanted to play around with and that, that, that the idea of bigotry against magic was something I wanted to play around with. Because back in 2017, 18, when I wrote that book, we had just had an election and it was not a good place to be in. So I wanted to write a story about joy, about happiness, about, about kindness, but I also wanted to write about the Antichrist. So, <laughs> so I, I, I wanted, I, I'm going to focus specifically on Lucy for your question. The reason I, I included something like Lucy, the Antichrist, the six-year-old Antichrist in this book, was because I wanted this extreme to explore the idea of nature versus nurture. Lucy is the Antichrist. Everybody knows what that's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the end of humanity, this darkness rising up. But what if a person like the Antichrist 
was given to somebody like Arthur Parnassus, what would that look like? Would that person have to give into their nature or could they be nurtured to be who they want to be rather than what they're supposed to be? So that's kind of why some of those kids were included with that was because I wanted that kind of big extreme. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I like your shirt. Hi. Hi, um, my name's Abigail, and um, I, because you write in such a queer space, in such a warm space, I wanted to ask uh, a number of unpublished writers that I also write with, we're hearing more and more about editors are turning away from queer novels because hmm. they're worried about the political climate, and hmm. it's, that's becoming, it's always been a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and just uh, as a published author, I wanted to hear about how are you finding the climate and how do we keep getting queer books out there? You find the publishers, the editors, and the people who matter and stuff like that. I have not heard what you've heard, but then of course I'm not on the ground level at this point. But here's what I'll tell you. My publisher, Macmillan and Tor, they have never once asked me to minimize any part of the queerness in my books. I have never heard of another queer author being forced to do the same. Here's, here's what I want everybody here to understand. We, we, when we all think of, of pride, we think of it as a celebration. We think of it as streamers, balloons, parades, everything like that. No, pride is a riot. Pride started because we were fighting for our lives. Pride is here because we wanted to show the world that we exist. Writing in the space that you're writing in and doing what you're doing, you're gonna m meet some people who do not agree with what you do. And they are sometimes in the publishing industry. But I can tell you, straight from the bottom of my heart, they are very far and few between. Trust me, if word got out that an editor at a major publishing house was saying, we don't want to take queer books because of blah, 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 nobody would submit to that editor ever again. And I, frankly, if that happened and I heard about it and I knew that I wouldn't be shouting that name from the rooftops because people like that deserve to be publicly named and shamed. Because if you're seriously saying that a book has, that has queerness in it, might not be the best book to publish because of the current political climate, you tell that person to go to hell, man. That's ridiculous because we deserve to have our stories told no matter who we are, no matter what. And you know what? Sometimes it feels like a fight. Guess what? Queer people have always had to fight. We may always have to fight, but I would rather fight for what I believe in than to stand by and let everything else go. That's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, um, I'm Ashleen. Uh, thank you for your representation because I grew up in the 80s and 90s yeah. too and didn't so you have know. any idea. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you know. I lost my aunt back in March and I read Under the Whispering Door. Okay. And being a little girl who went to my aunt's house every Sunday to be served a hot cup of tea, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you is what would Hugo serve you? <laughs> so, how many of you guys know V.E. Schwab? Victoria Schwab. Okay. She's a lovely, lovely author. And back when Under the Whispering Door came out in September of 2021, we were still in the pandemic. And we did, uh, Victoria um, agreed to host one of the virtual stops that we did at a bookstore. And before we did this stop, um, she and I were chatting back and forth about how we wanted this hour presentation to go. And she said, we should make our own teas up there while we're doing that. And I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. She's like, I have this old fancy tea kit and these wonderful teas and these little like glass vials and I'll bring that on. I was like, oh, that's so cool. I'll bring my Bigelow orange spice rind tea that I get from <laughs> the store. <laughs> and I didn't tell her that, okay. I didn't tell her that, that I was bringing that on, but I did bring that on. And I'm sorry that I have to curse in front of children, um, but V.E. Schwab in front of my hundreds of people in front of my audience, when she heard my tea, she goes, wow, so you're just a basic bitch. <laughs> So, peppermint tea is uh, Wal he, Wallace's peppermint tea is what Wallace would make or what Hugo would make for me. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Hi. Hi. So my name is Tegan, and as someone trying to read all the Discworld books, what is your favorite Terry Pratchett story? Oh my God. <laughs> is that even possible to have a uh, guards, 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 maybe? I think um, Discworld as a whole is, is my favorite piece of fantasy. I'm just going to do it that way. Shut up. It, it, is my, it is my favorite piece of fantasy ever written. 
everything about it is, is, is absolutely perfect. So that's what I would, I would suggest. Um, I have not, has anybody here seen the second season of what, what is it? Um, Good Omens. Has it? Okay. Do they get gay? Yeah. <laughs> see, I always wanted to see what was going to happen with the rest of it, what he would have done with that story and everything like that. I think that's one of my most favorite. Uh, when Neil talks about how the story ideas that they had and that they were going to be working together, it just it makes my day. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you for Very your much. question. I appreciate it. Uh, hi. Hi. My name is Grace, part of the general reading public as well. Hooray! <laughs> Uh, in creative fields, you often hear of killing your darling. Yeah. And so I was very curious if there was any character theme or scene that you wrote that you were particularly proud of, but for the overall story whole had to be cut. The story I'm editing right now that I can't tell you anything about. There is a part that is so funny and it is so good. And I was cackling when I wrote it. And then my editor was like, eh. And I was like, are you insane? This is so good. She's like, read it again. And then I did. And I said, OK, it's, it's good. <laughs> and then she's going, read it again. And then I did. And I said, oh, crap. So then I cut it. But I'm saving it because I am going to um, share it after when the book comes out, just be, so I can show you that I have the parts that get cut are not gone forever. So I'm going to show you with you guys. And trust me, when you read it, you're going to laugh because it's funny. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Uh, hi. Hello, my name is Alex, and I just want to say you are my favorite author of all time. Love you. Oh, thank you. It was so good. Uh, you were so, so good. My question is, you said you know, you're a very character-driven author, so do you have a favorite character that you've written in all of your books? Oh, crap. <sighs> it's like parents, you know, well, I was going to say, that's like asking parents to pay, tell who their favorite kid is, I would say nobody does that. And then I realized my parents would do that. So <laughs> um, it's either a tie between Chauncey from The House in the Cerulean Sea or Gus from a book called How to Be a Normal Person. And I want to talk about that just real quick. How to Be a Normal Person is a book that I wrote in 2015. It is not fantasy. It is not science fiction. It is just a contemporary romantic comedy about asexuality. And that was the first time I came public about my own asexuality. That book helped me to discover myself, and so that's why the character of Gus will always be deep, deep in my heart that I love him so much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Over here. Hi, my name is Sophie. I feel like I know the answer already. But oh, good. I'm curious if House of the Cerulean Sea was inspired by Good Omens at all. No, it wasn't. No, uh uh. Though, for every time that the supposedly queer couple helps the Antichrist, you'd think that I'd have, you know, <laughs> this is good. No, uh uh. I wanted to write my own story. If anything, I think the biggest inspiration came from Diana Wynne Jones' Howl's Moving Castle, because there's a, a sense of peace and happiness that I felt in that book that I wanted to explore, which is why also. A lot of people are somewhat surprised after reading The House in the Sterling Sea to find out I'm not British. <laughs> so um, that's why I wrote that book the way it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And our last question. Our last question. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask how and why did you write your first book? I'm sorry, say that again? I just wanted to ask how and why did you write your first book? Because I felt like I was going insane in my head. Like I told you, I could have either grown up to be a psychopath or a writer because I hear voices in my head. I made the choice to become a writer, which I'm sure we're all grateful for. Um, but I wrote my first book because I knew if I didn't do it, I never would. I was in my 20s, and I had it in my head that I was going to write the great American novel, and it was not. Um, but I did it because I had had too many people in my life telling me I could not do it. And I wanted to prove all of them wrong. And look at me now. I proved every single one of them wrong. Thank you. Perfect. So, you have I'm going to tell you guys, before we end, I want to tell you guys a quick story, OK? So I want you to imagine it's deep in the pandemic. You are reading The House in the Cerulean Sea with your Southern Baptist church group. <laughs> and you decide to contact the author to see if he will come and speak at your church group. I got this email from this lovely community asking me if I would come and speak at their church. I did. It was over Zoom. 
I want you to imagine row after row on my computer screen of elderly white woman, <laughs> all smiling, all warm, all happy, except for one. Uh -huh. In the top right corner, there was a woman glaring at me the entire time. She didn't speak, she didn't say a single thing. She just glared. Everybody else was totally chill, everything was totally fine, the conversation went well. So I ended thinking, okay, I'll never hear from any of them again. Guess who emailed me the next day? The very angry woman. Why was she angry? Oh, she let me know. She let me know that she was so angry with me and disgusted that they picked this title because there was the Antichrist in this book. Did I not know who the Antichrist was? Did I not know who, what the Antichrist was going to do? And while she did come to care about six-year-old Lucy, she wished I'd gone in a different direction. <laughs> then she ended the email with the best sign-off of any email I've ever received from anybody ever. Uh -huh. So much so that I use this sign-off in every email that I do for my friends from here on out. After taking me to task for including the character of the Antichrist, she ends the email by saying, but I did not mind the homosexuals. <laughs> so remember, if you ever experience bigotry, make them so mad about something else, they'll forget about the gays. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And don't forget, if you would like to get your book signed, 1.30 at our book signing area on the second floor. Thank you for coming to the and National And everybody, book call Festival. Lee Shogun, please, oh, thank our you. National Archivist. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.